Thank you for making time to join us on Media Live on TV3, also live on DSTV Channel 279. My name is Grace Hamwa Asare, coming up this afternoon. Ghanaian voters twice as much likely to vote for parliamentary candidates who provide infrastructure, that's according to a CDD research. And on the international front, thousands of protesters in Hong Kong take to the streets despite a police ban. Now, let's go to our first story now. Ghanaian voters are twice as much likely to vote for parliamentary candidates who provide infrastructure development than those who promise financial support to individuals, according to research by the Center for Democratic Development. This is an adverse contrast of propagated opinion that MPs are voted to be lawmakers. The research comes around a time political parties are preparing for their primaries. The CDD said it conducted the research between November to December 2018. It established that constituents want to meet their representatives regularly to listen to their concerns and be debriefed on parliamentary debates. A key finding was that voters preferred candidates who pledged to spend the MP's common fund on infrastructural development as compared to one who plans a reverse. The reason why I conducted this research is to make sure that we begin a conversation about uh, what exactly citizens want from members of parliament. And then that generates the second order question as to whether the members of parliament are doing the job that citizens want. It's important that we understand on what basis people make choices of who their MPs should be to be able to evaluate them on, on those dimensions. The study uses a focused choice conjoint survey experiment with a sample of a 2,000 with a sample of over 2,000 citizens located in 12 nationally representative constituencies. The respondents were asked to choose between two hypothetical candidates contesting four parliamentary elections in their constituencies with a set of attributes. Let's go to the health sector where the Ghana Health Service is to conduct a mass drug administration on neglected tropical diseases in one to six districts nationwide. The initiative is targeted at communities faced with frequent cases of elephantiasis and river blindness. Available statistics from the World Health Organization show more than one billion people in the world suffer from some neglected tropical diseases. The statistics show that most affected persons are usually poor and cannot afford the right treatment. As part of the initiative of the Ghana Health Service, drug catering for elephantiasis and river blindness will be distributed to 126 districts in the country next week. This, according to the chairperson of the program, Reverend Dr. Joyce Ayi, will go a long way in helping eradicate poverty in the country. Preventing and controlling these NTDs is central. Five of the most prevalent NTDs, elephantiasis, trachoma, bilharzia, river blindness, and intestinal worm infestation can be treated using drugs that have been proven safe and effective. The representative of the Director General of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Patrick Abwaji, spoke about the importance of improving on social mobilization in all endemic districts. Now we need to improve on social mobilization. Must start early in all endemic districts and engage all relevant stakeholders, including the traditional and political authorities, religious authorities, opinion leaders, media, Again, all relevant avenues for social media must be explored to improve its impact on the endemic districts. He called on local organizations to come on board and support the initiative as this will ultimately benefit the whole country. 
To other stories now, two Gambian soldiers have told the Truth, Reconciliation and Preparations Commission that they participated in the 2005 execution of 56 West African migrants, including 44 Ghanaians, on the orders of former President Yaya Jameh. In addition to the Ghanaians, the massacre victims included citizens from Nigeria, Senegal, Togo, and Cote d'Ivoire. Lieutenant Malik Jata and Corporal Omar A. Jalo revealed to Gambia's Truth, Reconciliation, and Preparations Commission that the migrants were executed by the Jungler Squad, a paramilitary force that took orders from Jameh across the Gambian border in Senegalese territory. A coalition of Ghana groups led by the former head of the Ghana Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, Raj Justice Emil Short, has called on the government to expedite actions, steps legal, political, diplomatic, to make sure justice is served. Let's stay a while longer on this and speak with Samuel Abochi of Amnesty International a lot more on this. Thank you, sir, for joining us on Midday Live on TV3. Thank you. Thank you very much. And good afternoon. So, to good afternoon. Yours. You have been championing this cause for a while now. What does this testimony by these two soldiers mean to the pact that you have been championing? Well, it just uh, adds up to the evidence that we've been gathering uh, so long after the UN and ECOWAS uh, uh, commission that investigates the case in uh, 2009 uh, declared that the government of Gambia and its uh, institutions were not responsible mm. or directly or indirectly in the killing of the 44 Ghanaians and other West African nationals. Uh, we haven't stopped there. Fresh evidence shows that indeed the jugglers who were uh, the hit squad yeah. of Yaya Jame were responsible for the killing of these nationals. And then I interview with them, uh, especially that was done by uh, uh, Tri International and Human Rights Watch, shows that indeed the jugglers took orders from Isis Yaya Jame. Mm. And these two soldiers that uh, uh, spoke at the, at the Truth and Reconciliation, uh, Truth Reconciliation and Reparatory uh, Commission clearly goes to buttress our points that indeed we have enough evidence to show that Yahya Jameh and his allies were responsible for the killing of these 44 Ghanaians and other West African nationals. Mm -hmm. So fo following the reports by the Human Rights Watch, government said it was opening investigations into this issue. How does these two testimonies, what sort of urgency do they bring to, to the investigation that government wants to carry out? It, it, it does, it does. We should, we should, we should at this time, mm -hmm. uh, I think the government and its institutions at this time start looking critically into the evidence that are uh, showing up at the, at the commission and uh, start uh, thinking of how to proceed. Fortunately, we are already in the campaign mood. Yeah. We have lined up a series of activities to draw the attention of the government, to draw support from the citizens of Ghana, mm. because majority of the majority uh, of the people killed are Ghanaian. 44 of our nationals killed in another uh, uh, country. Yeah. We shouldn't take that like kindly me. at all. Mm. We should prove that every single life of Ghanaian is very important. Mm. Assuming these 44 Ghanaians are nationals of other countries, like the US, like Canada, like Australia. Can you believe the agency With and which? the resources that these people will push yeah. into getting finality to this issue? And that's why we are calling on our government specifically that we should demonstrate that the life of these 44 Ghanaians shouldn't go waste. And then we are calling on the West African country, especially Nigeria, Senegal, Togo, and Cote d'Ivoire, whose nationals were also involved in, in, this massacre. The, in this massacre to also support the campaign. Mm. Hopefully, we are thinking that Yaya Jameh will be brought from uh, uh, Guinea, Equatorial Guinea, to Ghana or any of these West Africa countries, especially Ghana, because of course we are we in the majority. Yeah. Yes, so we need to bring Yaya Jameh to Ghana and try him for crime against humanity and the killing of the 44 nationals. That is what we want our president, when he mounts the platform, 
with other West African president should push, push and push until Yaya Jame is, 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 is brought to Ghana. Mm. What will be an appropriate punishment or sanction for Yaya Jame from the perspective of Amnesty International? Well, justice, what the law says, of course, fair trial, the, our laws even says that innocent until, until. proven guilty. Mm. And so at this point, Yaya Jame is just a suspect in the disappearance and killing of these people. So we think that the, both international law and local law, Ghana has the responsibility of bringing Yaya Jame to account for his stewardship, his involvement. Because evidence at the, at the commission is clearly pointing out to the fact that those who were involved in the killing are saying that we were ordered. We were given ordered. Can you imagine that 44 people and other nationals were killed without the knowledge of the president, without the knowledge of the interior minister, without the knowledge of the IGP? Could that happen in Ghana? It can't. <laughs> so you see that clearly we should be able to link the killing of the people to the responsibility that should have been exerted by these institutions, including the president. Mm. So we want to establish how he was involved, how his uh, uh, junglers, or how the police or the, mili the military were involved in the killing of these people. That is what we want to establish. Mm. And we think that Ghana has that capacity to do that. Yeah, so uh, th th this case, bringing it to Ghana, it appears that not much of um, local interest is in the story. You earlier said that you have some programs to whip up the interests of Ghanaians. Quickly run us through yes, these programs. Yes, definitely. So on the 1st of uh, uh, August, we are, we are in Kumasi, the uh, second largest capital of Ghana. We are in Kumasi to, uh, for a, a, a forum, a public forum, engaging the political leadership of uh, Ashanti region. Mm. We are engaging heads of department. We are engaging the police. We are engaging the fire service. We are engaging the Commission of Women's Rights. We are engaging civil society to take them through the genesis of this fight and where we want them to support us, especially calling on the government of Ghana to take the lead in demanding for justice for these people. When we finish Kumasi, there are other regions that we are heading towards, mm -hmm. and we want, to, we want to encourage the public to join in the debate so that we do not allow the life of these 44 Ghanaians to go waste. We should cherish each other. Yeah. It's human right, a right to life and right to travel. There's no crime to travel. And so we have to call Yaya Jame and his allies mm -hmm. to justice. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for joining us. Samuel Abochi is with International... Is Agboche. Agboche, Samuel Agboche mm -hmm. yes. is with Amnesty International and also a member of the Jame to Justice Ghana campaign, which is a civil society coalition. You're still watching Media Live on TV3. We have more stories. So in the story of the week this afternoon, the revelation that the country spent some $4.5 million on this year's African Cup of Nations and get many Ghanaians. That's our story of the week and Kwachi Afreniyama has more. Few things unite the nation like football, so naturally matters relating to the country's national soccer team, the Black Stars, would arrest the interest of many Ghanaians. Prior to the 2019 African Cup of Nations, there had been demands for the sports ministry to release a budget for the tournament, but that did not happen. But finally, the sports minister, Isaac Esiama, revealed in parliament on Wednesday that the country spent some $4.5 million on the continental football event. Actual expenditure, your speaker, an amount of $4,564,000. $352 was expended from the training tour to the time Ghana exited from the main tournament. Providing further breakdown of how the $4.5 million was expended, he indicated the expenditure covered the playing body, technical team, as well as members of parliament. FA, $924,168 per diem for players, $187,050. Per diem for technical staff, $129,600. Per diem for additional technical staff, 
The disclosure will generate mixed reaction from MPs. The discussion would focus on the future of Black Stars coach Kwesiapia and the details of the budget. The minister and indeed the outfit that is in charge of the Black Stars should come with a definitive pronouncement on the coach, not leave him in limbo. If it's to be continued, a decision will have to be taken and it will have to be made known to him. If he is to be discontinued, he must be told. The Honourable Minister himself, there was a video that went viral uh, encouraging supporters uh, to uh, go on uh, a sketching more or less. We want these figures at least uh, break down for us to then understand, you know, what went into those itemized uh, uh, line items. Those line items, about six of them, including the MPs. And the way it was couched, as if all members of the committee went. Reacting to the statements made by his colleague lawmakers, the sports minister denied allegations that government sponsors supporters to Egypt to go on an excursion. I mean, that is neither here nor there. Because it was a decision by CAF and FIFA to organize all supporters in all the countries that participated for the excursion. So as a minister, I was briefed by the FA of Ghana, and there was a communication I had with the, of the supporters. I had to communicate to the supporters. So that's all that happened. But in a later interview, former sports minister Nilante van der Poy said the ministry has more questions to answer. I think we should have a committee to probe further the total budget and the expenditure of the ministry. Who gave out this money? Where did they take it from? Is it the fact that some other ministry's money was taken to finance this? Ordinary Ghanaians also had their say. I think it's very, very ridiculous, you know. We, it could have helped in resources like education, health. There should be an inquiry, you know, to set into this kind of stuff. This Afghan that they, they went to, they bought nothing, right? So the money they spent it on what? This conversation will not end soon. The sports ministry would have to convince Ghanaians that their taxes were put to good use and indeed justifiably. For TV3 News, Kwache Afreniama. So let us know how you feel about the story of the week. Send us your views and comments on our various social media platforms and they will be read live here. To other stories now, the National Disaster Management Organization, NADMO, is to demolish a 60-year-old kindergarten structure in Kumase of the Denchembo, in Kusi of the Denchembo districts of the Ising region. The building, which was stripped off during a rainstorm, has been declared a death trap. Built in 1960, the Methodist Primary School housed in this structure has seen no major refurbishment. Ripped off roofs, gaping cracks, the building has been declared uninhabitable. A severe rainstorm in 2018 ripped off the building that housed about 70 kindergarten pupils. In a desperate attempt to get help, the school mounted pressure on the municipal assembly and the education office for assistance. The school on its own has purchased roofing sheets to roof part of the ripped off roof. The rainstorm ripped it off and you've been able to put some few ceilings on it again. It still doesn't make it safe. It's safe some, somehow. It's safe somehow. When you say it's safe somehow, how do you mean? Because for the, for the uh, walls, they are strong. The walls, they are strong, just that the roofing caused the problem. The assembly says compromising the safety of the pupils is not an option to be explored. Some of the pupils have been moved into a new structure put up by the assembly, but many still sit in the disaster-prone classroom. In the last three months, the municipal chief executive, Seth Biri Kurang Ufusu says he has been forced to use assemblies internally generated funds to construct a three-unit classroom with an office block for the pupils. We hurriedly put this one in place. So now that this one is in place and the kids are moving, we will come and pull it down. Uh, we have, I think they are using only one classroom for KG. But I've spoken with the church and the church is putting up a place for them. Immediately they finish, we move the case out and pull it down. 
Whilst the school recognizes the intervention by the assembly, there remains an urgent need of decks yet to be supplied. We will review our budget very soon and we will include furniture in it. So hopefully by the end of the year, the assembly will also provide some of the, the furniture to some of the schools. We cannot do all at the same time, but uh, gradually we know we will get there. Now, the Minister for Communication, Esla Utsue Kufo, says government is determined to deal with cybercrime issues in the country despite the financial challenges it is facing. At a workshop on the cybersecurity bill, the minister noted that the communication ministry is working in partnership with some foreign security agencies and the World Bank to find lasting solutions to the canker. 2018 annual report conducted by Global System for Mobile Association GSMA shows that about half of the world's population, which is 3.5 billion, use mobile internet and it is expected to reach 5 billion by 2025. In Ghana, as of January 2019, about 10.32 million people were active internet users. This has opened the country to risk of cybercrime with many citizens experiencing identity theft, social engineering scams, and other cybersecurity related breaches. At a workshop on the cybersecurity bill, the Minister of Communication, Esla Usu Ekufu, complained over insufficient financial support to fight the Kanka. We need a legal framework which identifies potential sources of funding for this to be able to give effect for it and so government needs to find the money all of us need to commit resources on the cyber security bill which is currently before parliament the minister urged heads of security agencies to support its inaction to attain the goal of securing the digital space she noted it is a crime for individuals to post indecent images on the internet and urge the public to report such persons to the appropriate agencies for sanctions if you receive data or, or images or posts which are of a pornographic nature involving children don't share it delete it from your device whoever posted it that it is illegal it is wrong so they should delete it the national cyber security advisor dr Enchibosiaku, observed that there is the need for government to set up mechanism to address gaps in the digital ecosystem within our digital ecosystem with respect to cyber security there are some gaps that we need to address but what we do not have there is a comprehensive cyber security legislation that will regulate our digital uh, system. The event was attended by representatives of various law enforcement agencies. Now, economic activities between residents of Orange Man in the Asin North District and Shidim in the Dunkwa District of the Central Region have ceased due to the non availability of a bridge on the Pra River at Asin Kushia. Transporting goods and passengers is now a challenge. Timothy and Chiyotu has more in the following report. Was discovered 25 years ago, but numerous calls and appeals on the successive government to construct proof futile until the ruling New Patriotic Party MPP government assumed office in 2017 and started the construction. The project commenced in January 2018, but nearly eight months down the lane, it halted with the contractor packing out. Sources indicate that the contractor did not receive the needed funds to complete the project. The bridge, when completed, would link Orange Man and Freedom. Equipment meant for the work have been deserted, leaving some to rust. The president of the Orange Traditional Council, Uhuna Bobrim Pra Ajin Sem the Sith, who is also the chief of Asin Kushia, admitted the bridge, when completed, would boost the economic fortunes of the area. The bridge will link River Pra to River Ofe and therefore Dunkwao. If anybody is going to Accra from Dunkwao, the person will spend three hours. If we are able to finish the bridge, it will take 40 minutes. So that's why I'm pressing that this is, this is a, a very important infrastructure. The Member of Parliament for Asin North constituency, 
Abina Drua Mensa also promised that the government would soon mobilize funds to complete the project. We were very happy when the government came to our aid because it had been like over 25 years that this thing had been taken to the government to come and help construct a bridge of our race. The contractors came to do the work. But unfortunately, for some time now, they've left the site. But even that, I know, I know for sure that the government is working to get the contractors back on site to complete the river for us. You're watching Midday Live on TV3. We are back with more stories after this break. Don't go away. Welcome back. Let's do business now. The Minister of Off Planning, Professor George Jan Bafu, has revealed an estimated amount of $2 billion as investors' funding will be needed for the Ghana Trade Fair Sites Redevelopment Project. He was speaking at the Redevelopment Project Investor Conference in Accra. The Trade Fair Land at La, a suburb of Accra, was acquired by Dr. Kwame Nkrumah by legislative instrument in 1960. Construction of the center commenced in 1962 and completed in 1966 for the first international fair proposed for February 1966, but was postponed to February 1967. The trade fair has now become a pale shadow of itself as most of the structures there have outlived their usefulness and are in bad state. This is about to change as the Ghana Trade Fair Company Limited has a master plan for the redevelopment of the site. The new master plan for the 156-acre land was designed by the British Ghanaian architect, Sir David Ajayi. 12 to 24 months for the infrastructure. Then any time from month 12 to 18, you can start with the horizontal development. And so you find first phase um, infrastructure, second phase the horizontal, and then of course all your landscape and finishes that come with it. CEO of the Ghana Trade Fair Company Limited, Dr. Agnes Edu, noted that GTFC will still maintain its core mandate. The project is expected to be completed in five years when the development starts. We have set out guidelines as to what percentage of your workforce you have to hire locally? What percentage of the materials can we support and help you source out locally? Ghana industry needs to be engaged in getting this project done. The phase one of the master plan will include retail malls, a convention center, exhibition halls, hotels, office parks, and made in Ghana village on approximately 100 acres of land. The phase two is to be developed into a marina, boardwalk, high-end apartments, amusement parks, and other facilities around the African lake on the residual parcel of land of about 56 acres. Minister of Planning, Professor George Janbafo, spoke about the benefits of the project. This estimated $2 billion investment that will generate additional tax revenue and I think the finance minister like that, from the new businesses and new uh, developments, and then an estimated 10,000 jobs, including 3,000 direct and 7,000 indirect ones, will be created throughout the value chain. The only structure that will survive the redevelopment is the round pavilion, which will serve as made in Ghana pavilion. And now let's talk about the budget presentation because economist at Data Bank, Courage Kingsley Mate, wants government to push for tax compliance to rake in more revenue and bring on board those left out of the tax net. He stressed the need for the state to time excessive spending to reflect the benefits of borrowing and donor support. He was speaking ahead of the media budget presentation on Monday. The mid-year budget review, which will be delivered by the Finance Minister, Ken Oforiata, will, among other things, focus on augmenting government revenue to fund outstanding social and economic policies. It will also afford government the opportunity to take a second look at revenue availability to execute the remaining programs, especially infrastructural development. 
revenue mobilization, which was highlighted in the 2019 budget, will remain a key feature in the media review. Concerns over the years are whether existing measures by government to mobilize revenue are really yielding any result. Government has, however, commenced efforts to cut some avoidable expenses. Key among them is the ongoing work on cutting out capacity charges for power that was not consumed. Economists at Data Bank Courage Marte cautioned government to cut the human face in task collection and prioritize automation in its process to shore up revenue. Increasing taxes or roping in a lot more people into the tax nets, then as politicians you expect them to be mindful of the outcome or the implication for, for, for their political fortunes. What we expect is for efficiency measures to be strictly pushed to ensure that existing taxes raise sufficient revenue to aid the implementation of expenditure um, plans for the year. He expects the finance minister to brief Ghanaians on the outcome of the port reforms, whether the gains are to weigh the losses. One drive that needs to be taken up seriously is the deployment of fiscal electronic device. This has been on the table for a while and we haven't seen that coming through. I think we need to accelerate the processes to implement and operationalize the deployment of fiscal electronic device because this is going to further deepen the VAT penetration rate because it's supposed to monitor the sales of VAT registered businesses in real time. On the luxury vehicle levy, he believes it has come to stay and expects government to redefine the levy to give clearer meaning to the taxpayer. He encouraged government to do the needful by enforcing compliance on tax collection and avoid avoid options of adding more taxes. So stay with all media general platforms on Monday because we bring you an in-depth coverage of the media budget presentation by the finance minister. Just for watching Media Live on TV3, we're back with more stories. Don't go away. Let's go entertainment now. Reggae dancehall musician Ras Kuku has been busy in the studio working on a 15-track album titled Kuntum Kunum Kun. The Strictly Reggae album features Black Prophet, Samini, Stoneboy and other artists from Jamaica. Ras Kuku is optimistic the Kuntum Kunum Kun album, which drops in September 2019, will win him many laurels. Kuntum Kunungu is an African word, the name for the most high. So we represent Africa, we represent black people. Kuntum Kunungu, when you listen to it, you have songs praising the most high, songs that talks about life song for the woman, song for mama, and the last one I think will be Papa, yeah man, so that it will balance and to become Alpha and Omega. So, Kuntun Kunungu is not a joke thing. I know we have a couple of songs on it, but then how did it all start for it? Yeah man, we've been working on the album since January. We are working on 15 songs and we are almost done. Yeah, it's not easy. No, I don't sleep. I'm always here because of Kuntum Kununko. Yes, we need to put some things in the music so that when the reggae album comes out, people will know that yeah, it is Kuntum Kununko and it is the heaviest, truly. A couple of times I've heard that it is difficult getting people to work with and all that. Did you encounter any of that? Uh, no, 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 no. For this album, yeah, I've given it to everybody and they are all working on it. Some have received, some I'll be receiving very soon. So everything nice. And who was featured on this project? We've got Black Prophet, the legend, Samini, the legend. We have Stone Boy, yeah, we have Miss V, we have Brahma from Jamaica. We have the Kerry James from the National Jamaica. representation. Yeah, man. Let's talk about something exciting now. It was all fun as a media general group held a special media get together and fun games for staff. 
Palm One music was served hot by the award-winning Kwampa Band. And oh, nothing I get hitmaker Famiye performed as well. Naftali Ba brings us the highlights of the event. <laughs> The forecourt of TV3 was a center of attraction as staff and management at Media General came all out to celebrate the media in grand style. The event was to show appreciation to the hardworking staff for their inputs towards the growth of the company. Yeah, for the first half of the year, Media General achieved 72% of our targets. That is great achievement for us and so I think that we need to congratulate ourselves each and every one of you have done very well and you need to be commended. That there was plenty to eat and drink, departmental rap battle, dancing and singing competition, water challenge, among other engaging activities were lined up for the fun-packed day. Five. Okay, here we go. Welcome, group. Come on. Okay. The fun continued with the award-winning band, Kwampa treating patrons to some live palm wine music as well as some 3FM's finest DJ on rotation. Then, the dance floor was opened to all to show off their dance moves. According to management, more of such events will be held to heighten staff morale. I always said I want, we are well entertained. Your creativity goes up. And we are supposed to be able to be more creative for our viewers and listeners. The excitement on the faces of staff was beyond description. I wish this thing would be happening every Friday so that, I mean, after hard days of work, I mean, we have this kind of refreshment, you know. So you get to fraternize with, you know, your colleagues. You don't get to do that so often. You're always working. You're always trying to give people the very best. So it means so much. All work and no play makes Shaq a dull boy. All play and no work makes Shaq a little guy. So I think just perfect. We needed this whining now. We needed it so much. After the months, the weeks that we've put in bringing out the best in news and being the first in entertainment, I think this is the best time for us to distress, to prepare us for the next quarter of the year, to give us our best. So I think we are excited and it's good that we are doing this. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy indeed. Don't forget to take time off your British schedule this weekend and relax. That's how we end this edition of Media Live on TV3. My name is Grace Hamwa. Sorry, log on to 3news.com and get some other stories. Good afternoon.